Well, we come to week two of our door series. And as you can see behind me, there's a few doors on stage. We wanted to get a, a visual of this. And each of these doors represent uh, something in, uh, in people's lives. And now, this series, the idea of this series has actually been on my heart and on my mind for uh, a few years. And I've been kind of putting it off and putting it off. It's like, I don't know if that'll, if that'll fly. I don't know if that'll go. But I, I just really felt like this was, this was the year, this was the time uh, in the season of our church that we needed to open up the door uh, of this series and allow God to do an amazing work in our hearts. And so these doors represent a way in which we do come to Christ or not come to Christ. And they represent excuses or an opportunity, however we want to look at, to uh, have Christ come into uh, our hearts as he knocks in our door. And so the main passage, and I'm going to be uh, mainly in Revelation chapter 3, so if you want to get your copy of God's word. We'll have the scripture on the screen. But uh, Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20, the main passage talks about Jesus knocking on the door. And it says this, here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. It's kind of like when the door knocks. When the door knocks, or, the, or, or maybe in our culture, the doorbell rings, right? And so uh, whether the door knocks or the doorbell rings and people are there at our house, it, there's some excitement, and we want to let them in. We have, uh, we, um, this past Christmas, uh, got our family a, a, a little puppy dog. And so uh, this dog, uh, his name's Beignet because he looks like a beignet. He's, he's white, sweet. You know, and uh, and he's full of energy, kind of like what you uh, what you have after eating several beignets. And so, um, this this awesome cute dog uh, gets so excited when when uh, people come over. I mean, it could be an armed robber, and he could come in, knock on the door, and and this dog would be so happy to see this person. But just like when someone knocks at the door, it's like, oh, there's someone at the door, and you listen for that, and you go and you let them in. You. Usually, all right, that's, that's really the, the nice thing to do. And that's really all that Jesus is doing. Jesus is not um, coming to knock down doors. He is simply knocking on the door. And what that door is, it's a door uh, of your heart. Now, in this passage of Scripture, in this section of Revelation, uh, and again, Revelation is, is basically in a, a vision, that God had, had given John. Uh, John, one of the apostles, one of the disciples, you know, uh, John, who uh, wrote the book of John, John 3.16, that John, right? It, John was exiled on the island of Patmos, and he was uh, given a vision uh, by the Lord, and uh, it is basically the revelation, and that's what it's called, the book of Revelation. And in this section of the book, he is talking uh, about, or Jesus is actually talking about because this section is, is all red letters. And so in the vision, John is seeing Jesus talk about the seven churches are talking to the seven churches in Asia Minor, which is in uh, now present day Turkey. And so he's, he has a message for these churches. Um, and, and one of the churches is a church at Laodicea. And so this church at Laodicea is receiving this message from Jesus. Now, all the other churches really kind of receive a, a positive letter. But Laodicea is a different kind of message. Jesus is giving a message that it's, it's, it's pretty blunt and actually very blunt. And there's a lot of correction in there uh, of, of their life and, and how they're doing ministry as a church. And really it all represents kind of their culture there in Laodicea. And we'll, we're going to get to that uh, throughout this message. But Jesus is knocking on the door of their, of their heart. And so why would he be knocking on the door there at Laodicea? Now understand this. When that this letter is is written to Laodicea, but this this is for us. That's why it's in Revelation. 
And it's really interesting study for you to go back and be able to see these seven churches and how Jesus is talking. And you can receive that in your life as well. But Laodicea, the message there is, uh, is something that we're, we're, we're going to read and we're going to see why did Jesus say, I'm going to knock on the door of your heart. And so if you would, let's go, go to Revelation 3 verses 14 through 20. Revelation 3, 14 to 20. And it says this. To the angel of the church in Laodicea, write. Now again, this is Jesus. This is red letters right here. These are the words of the amen. Calls himself the amen. The faithful and true witness. The ruler of God's creation. This is Jesus. I know your deeds. That you are neither cold nor hot. I wish You were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit. Another word for that is vomit. I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich. I have acquired wealth. And I do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Wow. That's pretty blunt. Right? Verse 18. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich in white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameless nakedness and salve uh, or solve to put on your eyes so you can see. Verse 19, those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. Lukewarm is kind of a a word that jumps out. I mean, you've heard this word if you've been a Christian for a while. You've kind of heard this, this term, lukewarm. It's the best example I've, I've seen is coffee. Now, I pretty much have coffee every day of my life. Now, the older I get, you know, the fewer cups I need to get because of the caffeine and everything, you know, but, but I like my coffee hot, like hot. And, but there are people that I know that like their coffee iced. I think that's really gross. But you do you, right? But, you know, pe- Starbucks and other coffee companies, they, they make a fortune with selling iced coffee. But, so you got cold iced coffee or hot coffee. Have you ever let coffee that started off hot sit somewhere on the counter on the table and you thought it was still hot Maybe it was there a little bit longer than you thought, and you go take a sip, and literally, you spit it back in your cup, because it is gross. Coffee that is room temperature is awful. You drink coffee cold or hot, nothing in between. I know of no one who drinks and loves coffee at room temperature. If that is you, you need professional counseling. You need prayer in your life because that is gross. But know this, that this coffee that is supposed to be hot or cold is, is that's what coffee should be, not at room temperature. And that's what Jesus is saying. Look, I'd rather you be one or the other. Right? Just so I know what to, we know where to begin, where to go from. But lukewarm, it's like, what do we do with you? So, what makes them lukewarm? What makes them look warm? lukewarm? Well, that begins there at verse 17. And as if we look there at 17, it says, You say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth, and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. So, what makes them lukewarm, Jesus is is telling this church that they are self-sufficient. They are self-sufficient. The church at Laodicea boasted about its wealth, a need of nothing. But the church deceived itself in terms of its spiritual condition it was wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Jesus, Jesus wasn't criticizing them for, for having money. He wasn't criticizing them for being wealthy. The problem was 
that their wealth allowed them to feel self-sufficient. Self-sufficient. Spiritually, the Laodiceans did not deny God or depart from the fundamental beliefs of the church. Rather, individuals took care of themselves, feeling spiritually wealthy enough. Spiritually wealthy enough. Experiencing the church enough to do so. So, the Laodiceans, they're just people who rely on their own resources. They rely on their own resources. They, they believe in God. They'll go to worship. But they tell God, uh, we got this. We got this. That sounds really familiar. <laughs> right? Doesn't that sound like part of our culture? Like, hey, we, we got this. We got this. It's kind of like if we get a call from North Cobb Christian School and say, hey, we're going to give you a building worth $150,000. We're going to give it to you. And I say, you know, I, I appreciate it, but we're good. We got this. We don't need that. <laughs> it's crazy. That would be crazy. That, but that's how the Laodiceans operated. This door right here, this first door represents that. Self-sufficiency. I got this. I got this. No need to worry. This first door. And so because of that, it's difficult to open that door and invite Jesus in to be there as a Savior and as Jehovah Jireh, God, uh, our provider. God is our provider. It's one of his names, Jehovah Jireh, our provider. God wants to be your provider. He wants to do that. You can't understand the joy that I see on the face of the facility director at North Cobb Christian when I showed up and, and she said, I'm just so happy that, to give this building. You know, we tried to sell it for several weeks and nobody would buy it. We didn't get any calls. And so I called um, someone to come out for the, uh, the electrical work and to turn it off. And I said, you know, we try to sell this building, but we just, we just uh, don't, we just don't know uh, what to do because no one's calling about it. We can't sell it. So the electrician just happened to be someone who lives in Bartow and kind of know the circles and communication and about what's going on with us. And he says, you know what? I think I may have somebody. It just so happened. And when I arrived and I was able to look at the building with one of our elders, she was ecstatic, overjoyed to be able to provide this. And it was almost like the, the fa- you could see the face of God, you know? You could see the face of God in her eyes. And to be able to see how God would react by providing this. The church today is filled with the door number one people called self-sufficient. The door of self-sufficiency. They don't need to attend church on a regular basis. No, this self-sufficiency. They don't need to be a part of a small group. No, I got it. I've got it. They don't need to give a full 10% tithe. No, I don't. I don't need to do that. God is ready to vomit the people who are self-sufficient. I beg you, church, to check your heart and listen to the door knocking for God, for Jesus to come in. Stop being self-sufficient. Don't be this door number one. Don't be this door number one. Eric Mosley, the pastor of All About Jesus Church, for those who were here last week or you watch online, we combined with them. What an amazing time. Of, 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 and I'm doing my best to keep up with what Eric uh, preached last week. But Eric did a great job of introducing this door number one and how oftentimes we don't open it because we got it all together. We don't, we don't need a provider. Jesus wants to be your provider. Will you let him come into your heart and fill every, every space. Now understand this. I'm not just talking about the, just the one time. Yeah, we need to have Jesus come into our heart, into our life. 
that, that one-time decision to make him Savior and Lord. But we've got to also open the door every day as believers. That doesn't mean you're, you're getting saved over and over again. I mean, it's a, sa- salvation is a one-time experience. But sanctification is a process that happens every day. And that's opening the door every day to let Jesus come in. Jesus wants to be your provider. Don't be the door of self-sufficiency. That's who the Laodiceans were. Don't be that. We see the next characteristic of the lukewarm Laodicean church in the first part of verse 18. Verse 18, it says, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich. So you can become rich, not money-wise, You can become rich with your life. And white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness. I'm going to focus on that. White clothes to wear to cover your shameful nakedness. You know, apart apart from my wife, those people who are here today watching online, I would... It'd be awful to see your nakedness. I mean, a lot of you look ugly even with clothes on, right? <laughs> but can you imagine? Can you, can you imagine the nakedness and the shame that comes with that, with, with, with not having clothes The city of Laodiceans, here's what's really interesting. The city of Laodicea was famous for its manufacturing of glossy wool. And and, and, I mean, they had a textile industry. And their their wool was actually a a dark color. They really specialized in this. Biblical scholars and historians say this. And so a lot of their clothes were sort of a, a dark color contrasting with the white clothes. And white clothing is all over Revelation. As you read that. And so Jesus is saying, look, I would rather clothe you in white than for you to be shameful and naked. And, I mean, we, we hide our nakedness. When first thing you get out of the shower, we, we cover ourselves. Even if we're home alone, I do that. Even though I, I know nobody's there. You know, I cover myself. Okay? Why? Because I'm naked. Shameful. So, clothing is symbolic of putting on righteousness. That's all over scripture. Making a contrast with that black clothing of the Laodiceans. He, you know, Jesus talks about that white clothing. But, nonetheless... Nakedness is often used in scripture to depict the shame of mankind in his or her sin. We see that at the, at the fall, at the beginning of creation. The third chapter in the Bible. Genesis chapter 3. If we look at Genesis chapter 3, verse 6 through 11. Verse 6 through 11. It says this. When the woman, that would be Eve, saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, Adam, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked. Everybody say naked. Yeah. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, This is Adam talking, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, Who told you, this is God speaking, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? So did you see what they did with their nakedness? With their nakedness, they hid 
from the Lord. They hid from his sight. The shame in your life, in our life, and we've all been, we've all been in a place where we feel like we are naked before God in our sin, in our shame. But this is causing us to hide from the Lord. There's no way, you, you may say this, there's no way God is going to look on the inside of this door. This door is filled with sin. Inside of my heart, sin and shame. And understand this, some of that shame could have been things that were even done to you. And not even your fault. But it's still there. It's still there. As you look at this door, it's got markings and and claw markings on it. Representing someone who's trapped in their own sin and their shame. And they feel naked before God. It could be that right now, maybe you're feeling the thumping of your heart because something in this message is causing a stirring in your heart. Your shame is keeping you away from fully inviting Jesus to be Lord of your heart. You're hiding from God, just like Adam and Eve. You're hiding from God. And, and, and another thing you're doing, and the only reason I say this because, because I've done this. I've been there. I've been at points of shame and sin in my life. And I hid from God. But another thing you do, because I've done this before, you're trying to cover your shame with fig leaves. (laughs) But it's just not enough. You're trying to cover yourself. It's just not enough. You need to stop hiding and start inviting Invite Jesus to be a part of your shame. But there's no way, Frank, that I'm going to let him see what's beyond this door. He will never understand. He will never understand what I've been through, what's been done to me, what I've done. He will never, ever accept me and what's behind that door. I cannot let him see that. I will not open that door. I can't do it. I know it's difficult. I know it's very difficult. But you need to stop hiding and start inviting. Only he can provide the covering as seen in Genesis 3.21. A few verses down from where we were. Genesis 3.21, it says this. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. Clothing them. And again, clothing is spiritual. Okay? According to this passage, what were the garments made from? It says skin. Right there in scripture. Skin. He made clothing of skin. So where did the skin come from? It was just Adam and Eve. There weren't any other people around. Where did the skin come from? It came from an animal. If it came from an animal and God made clothing from the skin of an animal, probably the animal had to die. I would imagine. Yes. So, you see, for their shameful nakedness to be properly covered, something had to die. For their shamefulness to be properly covered, something had to die. It's the same principle regarding our sin and shame today. For our sin and our shame to be covered, someone had to die, and that someone is Jesus. He laid down his life for you, offered up his own skin. His skin was ripped The blood poured, and he was that sacrifice to cover our sin and shame, just like God did in 
the Garden of Eden. So stop trying to cover your shame with fig leaves from the tree of good deeds. Stop trying to cover your your shame with fig leaves from the tree of good deeds. Don't think, well, my sin and shame is just too much. I'm I'm just I'm just gonna do some things that will help me with this. I'm I'm gonna do some things in my life that'll just make me feel good. I'll serve here. I'll give money here. I'll I'll just be nice to people. I'll do whatever it takes in order for that to go away. But let me tell you what. That is just fig leaves. And fig leaves will die. And fig leaves will wilt. And they just won't last. Only the sacrifice of Jesus and his blood will cover your sin and your shame. This second door of shame and nakedness can be transformed. For those who are, who are, who are focused on trying to, trying to fix your own nakedness by your, the fig leaves from a tree of good deeds, you know it's not working. You know it. But just know this. There is a Savior who's ready to take this door of your heart. Just like the blood shed on the cross. He wants to take this door of your heart. And he wants to say this one was bought at a price. This door was bought with a price. And that price is my blood. He wants to transform that door. See, you you can't do that with that door. (laughs) No matter how hard you try. Only Jesus can do that. There are people who never open that door because of the sin and shame in their life. They try to fix it. They try to make it good. And it's just not working. Jesus is saying, look, just open the door. Open the door. I'm knocking. Open the door. He's not going to kick it down. Just open the door so I can come in. The last characteristic we see of a, of a lukewarm church is spiritual blindness. Now, we're going to talk more details about door number three next week. But this coincides really with the church of Laodicea that Jesus is talking to. And it applies to us as well. As we see this in, in verse 18, at the last part of 18... And it says, so you can cover your shameful nakedness and a solve to put on your eyes so you can see. In, in Laodicea, there was actually, and biblical scholars, historians tell us this, in Laodicea, there was actually a medical school which produced an eye or ointment called cholerium. This ointment was known to cure some eye diseases. And it was a, a sort of a, an ointment or, or, or a salve. Similarly, the, the Lord offers to heal those believers so they can recover from spiritual blindness. The Laodiceans, the Laodiceans produced something that would help people with their blindness, but they they were blind to see that Jesus wanted to just open the, uh, let them open the door of their heart and be Lord of their life. They couldn't see that they were spiritually blind themselves. Door number three, blocking it off. Blocking it off. There's no way. And again, we'll talk more specifically about door number three. 
They're blind. These people are blind to the condition that they're in right now. And the church of Laodicea was that. So, as we, as we close, just as a reminder, uh, materials like gold and, and garments and, and eye ointment were Laodicea's chief exports. The Laodiceans boasted about their wealth, but they needed genuine faith that was far more valuable than material wealth. The city was famous for its manufacturing of, of glossy wool, this dark colored wool. But Jesus offered the church members white garments that would cover their spiritual nakedness. Laodicea was also well known in the region for its production of this eye ointment that was used to help with eye diseases. The Laodicean church was blind to spiritual realities of their own life. Jesus offers the solution for spiritual blindness. Do, do any of these doors represent you? Do any of these doors represent you? Maybe you've got a lot of self-sufficiency sufficiency in your life. You don't need a provider. Or maybe there's so much shame and nakedness in your life that you, you just don't want Jesus to come in and be a part of your life. Or maybe you're just so spiritually blind and you're blocking everything out because you can't see the real condition of your life. Let me, let me ask you a question as we, um, as we close. Who have you allowed to walk into your doors? Into your door. Who have you allowed to walk into your door? Has there been someone who walked through your door that taught you how to handle things on your own? Self-sufficiency. Has someone walked through your door that maybe brought shame into your life? Or has someone walked through your door that brought so much confusion from worldly perspectives that contradict God's word that you're blind to your own sinful condition. Because how you are right now in your heart, you got there because of who you've allowed to walk in that door. And Jesus is saying this, (laughs) just open the door. Open the door. Just let me come in. Let me be your provider. Let me cover you with my blood. Cover your sin and your shame. Let me open your eyes to who you can really be. Because I have a vision of, of who I created you to be, but you're blind. Jesus just wants to come into your heart, into your door. And at a one-time decision of salvation, but it goes more than that. It's an everyday choosing for Jesus through a process of becoming like him through what is called sanctification. Will you choose to allow Jesus to come in and do that. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If you would please. I, I want to make sure that you are totally focused on what God is trying to do here in this place. Or what God is trying to do online. And as you are just in this moment, just have a, have a time of, of reverence. And in just a moment, the band is going to lead us in another song. But during this time, I, uh, I want us to have a heart check. I want you to, I want you to check to see if, if maybe, maybe one of these doors is your situation right now. One of these first three doors, could this be you? And, and particularly today, our, our focus is really that door, that second door of, of shame and nakedness. And if that is you, we need, you just need to give that over 
trust in Jesus. So if you want to accept him as Lord and Savior, we're going to do, have that opportunity right here, right now. You might, be, uh, you might be working out and listening to this, or you might be driving in and listening to this later, or you may be watching this at home right now. And obviously there are those who are watching you here live in person. But just know this, God wants to do a work in your heart. And all it takes is this, a simple prayer, and just repeat after me, say, Jesus I hear you knocking. I'm really afraid to open my door, but I trust in you. So I'm opening the door of my heart. Come in and clothe me with your precious blood. Wrap me in your holiness and remove and cover my sin and my shame. Please do that for me. I'm tired of covering myself with fig leaves that just don't last. Please be my Savior. Come into my heart. Be Lord of my life. I surrender myself to you. Or maybe you're here today and maybe you have prayed a prayer similar to that at one point in your life. But Jesus is saying, you know, I knock on your door every day and I just want to commune with you. Every day, Jesus said in that passage in Revelation, just so I can come in and sit and eat with him. Last time I checked, we eat pretty much every day. And so... Jesus just wants to be a part of your day. And there are days I've been there too. No, I'm not going to open the door. I don't really need Jesus to come in and be a part of my day, of my life. But Jesus wants to be there to give you a new life. Just as the morning sun brings a new light, Jesus wants to bring in that new life into your day, every day. You just got to open the door. And so if you have been guilty of keeping that door closed, you just, at this time, just say, Jesus, I'm sorry. Sorry for being self-sufficient, thinking I can do everything on my own, and I'm sorry I've not allowed you to be the provider for me. But I, I'm ready for you to come in every day, and I, I just, I need to do more of that. Please forgive me. I do that right now. And so at this time, whether online or right here, as a band plays, we're going to stand in just a moment and we're going to allow you to have that moment right there at your seat or there in your living room. The altar's open. You can come down here. I'll even be down here and I can pray with you. But just know this. This is between you and the Lord, the one who's knocking on the door of your heart and he's ready to come in. He's ready to fill you with new life. Ready to cover you ready to provide for you. Will you do that today? Let's all stand. Stand together as a band sings and plays. Let's sing along and let's have some time of prayer. And come out of sadness, come wherever you've been, and come broken hearted, let a rescue begin. Come find your mercy, oh sinner, come near. Cause earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. And earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. So lay down your burdens. Lay down your shame. Lay down your hurts, 
sorrow that heaven can't heal. What a great line. Earth has no shame that heaven can't heal. Earth has no sin that heaven can't cover up. So your your door number two of shame, Jesus wants to take care of that. Open that door. If you've done that today, I'd love to hear about it. You can send me an email. I'm pastor at lakepointonline.com. Pastor at lakepornonline.com. I'd love to hear about it. love to be able to pray with you about that. But just know this. Jesus loves you. We love you. You're not in this alone. Trust me. And so uh, we'd love for you to continue to walk on our journey as we go through door number three next week. And of course, I can't wait for door number four starts in a couple of weeks. Then after that, we got Easter. Lots of great things happening. Love you guys. We'll see you back here next week.